Hey guys, and welcome. My name is Tyson. Yeah, and we're going to get straight into it today. Because I know that I've had a busy week, and church is something that I, that I always look forward to. It's a great finish to my week, and it's a great beginning to my following week. Today, put every bit of your energy in today. As much as, I, as much as you can physically give, because I trust the Lord is working amongst us today. He will fill us up with the Holy Spirit, so that when our levels are low, we may still give even more, beyond our own capabilities. So I invite you to stand with me, church, and sing. Dear Lord, today we give thanks to you, Lord. We praise you for who you are. We praise you today for we know that you do not change. You do not leave us. We thank you, Lord. Yet that when we're stuck between a rock and a hard place, there's actually a third option. We can lean into your love, Lord. We thank you for guiding us and being in relationship with us. Thank you, Lord. Amen.
spoke a word you were singing over me You have been so, so good to me Before I took a breath You breathed your life in me You have been so, so
We confess today. We are broken people. There is no hiding it. We are tempted by sin constantly, yet we can't always resist. We are innately damaged. Yeah, but that's why we need you so much more. You make us whole. You fill the holes with your love, your wisdom, and most importantly, your grace. You bring us out of pain and hurt. You direct us to greater paths, and you hold our hands along the way. Amen. Hi, my name's Josh Shearer, and I'm the lead pastor here at Gawley Uniting Church. I wanted to thank you for joining us today. Wherever you are, I'm grateful that we can lead you in worship, and I hope that this service encourages you and builds your faith. We're in week five of a series called Five Things God Uses to Grow Your Faith. And I'll be explaining uh, during the message later on about personal ministry and the way God uses it to build our faith and grow his kingdom. There's two things that I wanted to tell you about today. The first announcement is around returning to worship. If you're new with us, we have three churches in our parish and each of them are at different stages of returning to -to face-to-face worship. Sandy Creek have returned today purely, uh, and they're hosting purely those that are members of their church, and that's due to the spacing restrictions they've got there. But I want to shout out to Williamstown and Gawler, our other two churches that are joining us for online gatherings at the church facility and also at home. Hopefully you would have received our news from the parish email during the week, and if you didn't, you can find the link to the whole email on our Facebook page. But in it, I included a short survey for members of our parish and those wanting to visit our churches as we begin returning to -to face-to-face worship gatherings. You'll find a link for it in the description of this video as well. One of the challenges we've been facing in this season is leading with limited information. And we'd love to hear more from you, and it'll take you less time to complete it than it does for me to complete these announcements. I promise you that. And so that's the first thing. The second thing I wanted to tell you about is prayer night. It's this Tuesday night, 7.30 to 8.30 p.m. at the Gawler Uniting Church Hall. One of our core values is fervent prayer, and we believe that prayer is the most important thing that we can do as a church. If we're not seeking God with real, authentic prayers for the lives of those in our towns and those we love, then there's little point in us doing anything else as a church, because God is the one that brings transformation. And so I'd love for you to join us in person if you can for an hour, or if you can't, pray from home if you can't be there. But that's it for our announcements. And so now I'd love to lead you as we honor the offering that has and will be given during our service. If you're not familiar with all of that, we believe everything we have is from God and God invites us to honor Him by giving just a small percentage of what we have back to Him through the work of the local church. And it's about us choosing to trust God with all of our life, beginning with the thing over which we want the most control. And this is a calling for those that are followers of Jesus. So if that's not where you're at, or you're visiting us for the first time, there's no pressure to give at all. But if you believe in, and if you value what we are doing as a church, I'd love you to invest in it as you are able. The details are there on the screen, so you can participate as you wish. But as you do so, I'd love you to join with me in prayer. Let's pray. Our loving God, I thank you. I thank you for the opportunity to honor you with what we have been given. And Lord, whether we consider we have a little bit or a lot, Lord, all of it is from you. And so Lord, we thank you that we can give a portion back. We thank you that we can support your work in the world through the local church. And so Lord, I pray for those that are going to give those that have already given. Lord, I pray that you would bring blessing in their life in the ways that you would see fit. Lord, I pray that you would continue to transform our hearts of what it means to prioritize you over the things in our life. And loving God, I ask that you would open our hearts and minds and and help us as a church to steward that which is given really well, to see communities transformed with the good news of Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I 
I'll worship your holy name. The sun comes up, it's a new day dawning. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever way pass and whatever lies before me. singing when the evening comes. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I'll worship Your holy heart is kind for all your goodness I will keep on singing ten thousand reasons for my heart to find bless the Lord oh my soul oh my soul worship his holy His holy name. And on that day when my strength is failing, the end draws near and my time has come, still my soul will sing your praise on end. years and forever more. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I'll worship His holy name. His holy name. I worship His holy name. Dear God, we pray for others today, believe it or not. We pray for the broken and the damaged, that they too may find your love that they may feel the overwhelming, never-ending wave of grace and peace wash over them. We also pray for the believers who are struggling, whether they're 30 days into their journey or 30 years. Here we pray that you would be in their ear, by their sides, with their hands, guiding us as a father does to his children. Amen. As we begin the message, would you pray with me? Loving God, we thank you for the opportunity to open your word today and to hear whatever it is that you want to say to us. Wherever and whenever people may be hearing this, I pray by your spirit that it would speak into people's lives to bring transformation and renewal. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, we're in part five 
of a series called Five Things God Uses to Grow Our Faith. And as the name suggests, we're exploring different ways that God uses the things in our world and the things in our life to grow our faith and our trust in Him. To to give you a bit of a recap of where we've been so far, uh, in week one I explored the the basic idea behind this whole series and that it's God's heart that we would grow our faith and our trust in Him. It's what God's been trying to do from the very beginning when we were separated from Him in the garden. When we betrayed that trust, God actually wants us to re-trust Him again. And that happens by us growing and developing our faith, by having confidence in God. And then week two, we looked at the first of the five faith catalysts, which was practical teaching. God builds our faith when we hear the Bible explained and opened and applied, not just to a life, but applied to our life. But then the second one was providential relationships. God uses people around us to build our faith. And that the people that we surround ourselves have the ability to affect the trajectory and quality of our life. Last week, Craig explored private disciplines, the things that we do, the things that we should do because Jesus asked us to, that are just between God and us. No one else knows about them. And Craig highlighted giving and reading scripture and prayer. And he, but Craig also reflected that changing our habits won't make us happy, but changing our heart will. And, and that's what God wants for us when we engage in private disciplines. It's the foundation of our faith that's built on the moments that no one sees. And so this week we are exploring personal ministry, and I'll get to that. But next week, Mel's going to wrap up with pivotal circumstances. There's moments in our life that we would never choose to happen necessarily, but they leave us with a choice to either draw closer to God or to step further away from Him. And so I'm excited to hear Mel explore that next week. But let's jump back to personal ministry. The big idea that I want you to take away from today is that personal ministry provides opportunities for us to grow our faith. So simple. The personal ministry provides opportunities for God to grow our faith. And if you're a follower of Jesus, you might be able to reflect on a moment when God called you out of your comfort zone, out of the things that you knew how to do, out of the things that were comfortable for you, and asked you to do something that you didn't feel equipped or prepared for. But what happened was that as God called you out, God met you there and you learned to trust Him. It might have been leading for the first time, whether a small group or a larger gathering. It might have been a short-term mission trip or leading a kid's ministry, hosting a life group, serving communion, whatever that might have looked like for you. There could be a moment in your life when you noticed that you stepped out of your comfort. God met you there and it grew your faith. See, for me, I think about the first time that I ran a small group Bible study. I was 16. I don't know what our minister was thinking because I was unsupervised. I had no idea what I was doing. Yet God met us there as a bunch of young guys and young girls just faithfully sitting down, opening scripture and praying with one another. We had some powerful discussions of faith that profoundly shaped us into the future. So, I think of that time, God met me there through personal ministry. Or perhaps my jump into pastoral ministry. I still remember that phone call from a minister I didn't know for a role as a part-time pastor focused on building small groups and a discipleship ministry. And to be honest, my response to her at that time was, you know I'm a police officer, right? I don't know a thing about what it means to build a small group ministry. I don't know what it means to be a discipleship pastor. But I stepped out in that moment and God met me there. And I've got to tell you that he's grown my faith through that expression of personal ministry. And so this is a really powerful principle that God uses in growing our faith. That when we step out of our comfort zone, God meets us there and we learn to trust God even more than we did before. And today I want to turn to a passage in the Gospel of Matthew. It's the first book of the New Testament. And we're looking at Matthew 14 verses 13 to 33. If you have a Bible with you, I invite you to follow along. The passage will be on the screen as well so that you can follow along. But Jesus takes his disciples through this exact situation to build their faith and their trust in him. And as you'll see, they do what they know how to do, 
and trust Jesus to do what only he can do. These two seemingly separate events from Jesus' life and ministry are linked by this idea of personal ministry and stepping out when we don't feel like we've got what it takes. So to give you some context for this passage, Jesus' cousin John the Baptist, the one who prepared the way for him, had just been arrested by King Herod. Basically, he kept using the king's new unlawful marriage as a sermon illustration, and the King Herod got tired of hearing about it. He was arrested and thrown in prison, and eventually he was executed for that. And Jesus receives this news in the middle of his public ministry, and that is exactly where this passage picks up. So when Jesus has heard what had happened, that is, he heard about John the Baptist's his cousin's death, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. But hearing about this, the, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. When Jesus landed and saw the large crowd, he had compassion on them. And then he healed their sick. And as evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, but this is a remote place. There's nothing around. It's already getting late. Send the crowds away so that they can go to the villages and buy some food for themselves. But Jesus turns to them and he replies, they don't need to go away. You give them something to eat. You give them something to eat. And I I just want to pause there for a second. Have you ever had one of those moments where you notice something that needs to change? A crystallization of discontent, I've talked about it in sermons before. An idea, something you notice that you just can't shake. So often we see it, but instead of stepping out, we just pray for it. We pray for God to send someone to fix that problem. But what I want you to consider today is, could it just be that whatever that thing was that you've noticed, like the disciples noticing the crowds needing food, could it just be that that thing that you noticed God wants to use to grow your faith? God's actually inviting you to do something that you don't know how to do. It could be that young guy at church that doesn't have a role model. It could be that invitation to host a life group that you don't feel equipped for. It could be the need for band members. It could be that opportunity to serve on the tech team or the welcome team or to help us out with live streams or something like that. It could be volunteering at a local food bank or you care here in Gawler or, or whatever that looks like. Could God be asking you through discontent, through you being able to notice something, that there's something in the world that needs to change and that perhaps it's your role to do something about it? So Jesus says, in response to the disciples' question of, surely let's, these people need to go and feed themselves, Jesus responds, they don't need to go anywhere. You feed them. You feed them. But then I think our response is typical to what the disciples say. In verse 17 they say, we have here only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. Quite simply, they say, this, this is all we've got. I don't have what it takes to be able to feed all these people. I'm not good enough. We're not. And how often is that our response? When we see a need and we feel like God might be calling us to a need, so often our response is, I'm not good enough. I'm not holy enough. I don't know enough scripture. I've made too many mistakes in my life. I'm not cool enough. I'm not confident enough. I'm not articulate enough. I'm, I don't have enough time. I'm too busy. I don't have what it takes. God, please send someone else. That's the disciples. All they, all they see is their limitations. All they see is what's in, right in front of them. They've got five loaves and two fish. And how far can that go among so many people? And Jesus says, well, you bring them to me. Verse 18. Bring them here to me, he says. So in the face of a need, with a, a discontent, the disciples can only see what they've got. And what's Jesus' response? He says, bring me what you've got. Bring me what you've got. 
And he directed the people, in verse 19, he directed the people to sit down on the grass and, and taking five loaves and two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and he broke the loaves. And he gave it to the disciples and then the disciples gave it to the people. Now, I wonder if you could put yourself in the disciples' shoes in this moment. You've, got, you've given this stuff to Jesus and, and then Jesus breaks it and gives thanks to God for it and then, and then turns and gives it to you and you're sort of facing him and he's facing you and the crowd's behind you or whatever and, and you just sort of look up at Jesus and you're like, this? You, want, you want me to give this out? I thought, is, is, is this my lunch? Is, what, what am I supposed to do with this? What about everyone else? Are they still here? Have they gone? Can you imagine what it would have been like, the disciples, seeing this meager offering of food in their hands, and Jesus says, go give it out. Go give it out. And see, what we discover is that the disciples in this moment aren't doing anything miraculous. The disciples, in response to Jesus' command of them of, you feed them. The disciples begin doing what they know how to do. And in that moment, Jesus does something that only he can do. Jesus called them, and using what they had and what they knew how to do, he did something miraculous. And what happens in verse 20? They all ate and were satisfied, and the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. And the number of those who ate that day was 5,000 men. And that didn't even include the women and the children that were there as well. So 5,000 households of people were fed on five loaves and two fish. Why? How? Because Jesus called. The disciples brought what they had. And they, knew, they did what they knew how to do. And Jesus did what only he can do. And I think, I think their faith in what was possible through Jesus absolutely soared that day, don't you? Because... I mean, mine would have, if, that, if I saw that. How could it not? But the thing is that Jesus is not done teaching his disciples about faith in this moment. The narrative continues because it says in verse 22, immediately, immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. It seems like this is a separate narrative completely, but let's read on. What I find, actually, what I find really interesting is dismissing the crowd. How do you reckon that went for Jesus? He just healed everyone and he just fed everyone. How do you reckon he would go dismissing a crowd of 5,000 families? He's like, yep, thanks everyone, go home, everything's fine. We'll, uh, we'll see you next time, thanks for joining us. Can you imagine them? They'd be like, no, nah, this is working out great, we're just going to stick with you. Sorry, that's a, that's a digression, but... I just find it funny, those little moments of, it seems so ridiculous how some things came to pass or why they were even in Scripture because they're just wonderful little ideas. Anyway, so verse 23, after he had dismissed them, so it proves that Jesus managed to get it done, after he had dismissed them, he went up on the mountainside, that is Jesus, to pray by himself. And later that night, he was there alone and the boat that the disciples were in was already a considerable distance from land. But the thing is, it was buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. And so here we just, what are the disciples doing? Well, they're rowing across the lake. It's, they're doing something that they'd known how to do. They'd done it dozens and dozens of times before. Some of them were even fishermen. But they were rowing across the lake just as Jesus had asked them to do. They were doing what Jesus sent them to do. But what we find is that they can't do it. For the first time ever, they can't do it. They're getting nowhere. They're like on a stationary rowing machine and they're getting fitter, but they're not getting anywhere. But I think Jesus had them there on purpose because he sent them. I think it's because Jesus wants to show them something. And so we pick up in verse 25. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them. But he didn't, walk, he didn't go out in a boat. He was walking on the lake. And when the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. They said, ah, it's a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, 
Take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. And Peter has a light bulb moment. Hang on a sec. That's Jesus. And this is the second time that Jesus has put us in an impossible situation. First it was trying to feed that crowd of people, and now we're out on a boat in the middle of nowhere. Jesus sent us here, and we can't seem to get anywhere, and we don't, we don't have what it takes to get across the lake like he asked us to. So there's something going on here. Jesus put us in a possible situation. And so in this light bulb moment, Peter decides to test his theory. And he says in verse 28, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come out onto the water. Tell me to come out onto the water. Now, I think there's something really significant we need to pick up on here. Because I've heard it preached that Peter gets out of the boat and, 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 and Jesus enables him to do extraordinary things. And both of those things are true. But you've got to notice who spoke first. Peter did. But what did he say? He said, Lord, if it is you, you need to tell me to come. Because... Plenty, uh, to be honest, I've seen plenty of dumb things done in the world because people stepped out in hope and hoped that Jesus would catch them and do something miraculous in their midst. But this, this idea of personal ministry, about stepping out of the boat, stepping out of our comfort zone, is not about doing what we want to do and trusting that God will be with us. It's about responding to the call of God upon our life, that holy discontent that exists that we see, something that we just can't shake, knowing that we don't have what it takes, but trusting Him anyway. This is about responding to God's call. And sure enough, in verse 29, Jesus says, come. And then Peter got down out of the boat, and he walked on the water and came towards Jesus. Now, Peter didn't know how to walk on water, but he knew how to get out of a boat, and he knew how to walk. And so when Jesus called, he did what he knew how to do and trusted that Jesus could do what only he could do. But then what happens next in verse 30? But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink. He cried out to the Lord, Lord, please save me. And immediately... Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and he caught him. And he said, you of little faith, why did you doubt? It's amazing to me how, how quickly fear sets in and our ina- inadequacy in a situation gets the better of us. When we take our eyes off of Jesus and begin trusting in our own abilities and our own capacity, we suddenly realize how far outside of our capacity we are in these moments of personal ministry when we've stepped out of the boat. But when we do, when we do, what we can't miss is that even when we notice how far out we are, that the boat is so far back we can't reach it, but Jesus is still so far away and we can't get there either, and we're standing there on the water with our own, and the only things we know how to do is get out of a boat and walk, but somehow we find ourselves walking on water, and when we lose faith in that, Jesus is there. He reaches out His hand when we lose heart. And I once read this, this was like, Peter, I'm so disappointed in you. Why did you struggle to believe in me? Why didn't you have enough faith? But then now that I'm a parent, I've actually, I read this a little bit differently. I don't think Peter was chastised by Jesus in this moment. It was almost like it was an encouragement. Now I'm watching my daughter Phoebe learn to walk. And she sort of takes one step and she takes two steps and then she sort of stands there and thinks about it. And sometimes she keeps going, but sometimes she doesn't. Sometimes she just sort of loses courage and sits down. And my heart is not one of disappointment to her. My heart is, you almost had it. Why did you stop believing? 
You almost had it. And I do wonder if that's Jesus' heart for us, if that was Jesus' heart for Peter. But in those moments when we stepped out of the boat and we're giving it a go and we're trusting in what we know how to do, but we're also trusting in what Jesus has to come and do in our midst. And we lose faith and we lose heart and we give up and Jesus is right there and he says, you almost had it. Why did you doubt? But then they climbed into the boat, and the wind died down. And then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly this guy is the Son of God. What happened? Their faith went through the roof. It was almost like, well, we watched you feed the 5,000, and Jesus, we we suspected that you were the Son of God before, but, but now we know that you're the real deal. But the one thing that I think is so important is the objective of this whole exercise wasn't to feed 5,000 people and wasn't to see Peter do something cool. I think the objective of this, these two narratives from Jesus' perspective was to, to build the disciples' faith and trust in him. Because ultimately, they would be the ones that he would hand this whole thing over to. And it's actually on them that we are here today because it was on them that they they were the ones who took the the gospel to the nations it was off of their faith and their trust in Jesus how extraordinary and so here we've got two beautiful narratives about building faith and trust in Jesus and so what do we do with this you've always got to ask that question well quite simply I think it's Where is God asking you to step out of the boat? He's heard all of your excuses. He's listened to your explanations. He's waited patiently as you've distracted yourself with Netflix and and Disney Plus and, and Facebook or whatever. He's inviting you to get involved and to trust Him. But it's it's not about filling a need. It's not just about feeding five thousand people or figuring out how to walk on water, although those things might happen in whatever that looks like in your life. But it's actually as much about fulfilling a need as it is about God inv- inviting you to build trust in Him. So it might be that out of this, you've got the opportunity to, to begin hosting a life group in your home, or it might be that you get to put up your hand to help out in children's ministry, or step up to lead in the next Alpha series for people that are new to faith, to volunteer on the tech team, to host church online gatherings on Facebook, or to do it in your home. But, but I believe that God wants to use personal ministry, the, the opportunities for us to get involved and get out of our comfort zone, to grow our faith in Him. And to begin trusting Him that little bit more. But what I've got to promise you is that you won't have all the answers to do those things that God's placed on your heart. You won't have all that it takes. But you you do know how to do something. You know how to put the kettle on. You know how to put your TV to church online. You know how to love people. You know how to play an instrument. You know how to move a camera. You know how to go on Facebook. So you do know how to do something. And so could it just be that God's inviting you to do what you know how to do and He will do what only He can do in your midst. And believe it or not, that this service right here and the people that are getting involved, the people that have put this on, this service was only possible because of the people that you see and the people that you don't see that did exactly what I'm talking about. When the opportunity called, each one of them began by doing what they know how to do and trusted God to come through. Tyson lead the service today. When I first met Tyson, he barely had the confidence to be able to speak without stuttering at all. But here he is speaking to the world through church online, leading a service. He does what he knows how to do and allows God to do the rest. Next, year you're going to hear from, next week, you're going to hear from Mel. She's preaching for the first time ever. 
because I had a sense that God wanted to speak a powerful word through her. She's a high school chemistry teacher. And she never believed she would have what it takes to preach. But next week she's going to do what she knows how to do and trust God to do what only he can do. And I believe it's going to be powerful. Because I believe God will meet her there. And so I believe that there is a holy discontent that God has placed upon your life. And he wants to use it not just to fill a need, but to grow your faith in him, to grow your trust, to grow your confidence. And it might feel like he's asking you to walk on water right now, but actually what he's asking you to do is just step out of the boat and to start walking. And I believe that God will meet you there so that through you, he can do what only he can do. So would you pray with me? Loving God, I thank you. I thank you for the opportunity to explore this idea of growing our faith, to explore this idea of personal ministry. And Lord, we know that there are different challenges, different things that you've called us to in our life. And Lord, we've been, those, those, that call has been drowned out by our sense of inadequacy, our sense of not being good enough, not having enough, not being smart enough. But Lord, today I pray you would speak into people's hearts that they would listen to that call. And that it wouldn't be drowned out this time, but instead that they would step out and do what they know how to do. And allow you to do what only you can do. To see needs met, yes, but to far greater degree see their faith grow. And for them to trust and have confidence in you for the rest of their life. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, after hearing the message, I want to lead you in a time of communion. And if you're not familiar with what that's about, uh, communion is an opportunity. We call it a sacrament. And it's an outward sign and an inward grace at work in our life. So communion is the breaking of bread and the, the taking of a cup. But it's a symbol, it's a sign of the incredible work of grace that's happening in our life as we believe and remember ourselves with Christ and places trust in Him as our Lord and Saviour. And that's what we've been talking about this whole series, is how do we grow our faith and our trust in God. And communion is a beautiful expression of that trust in the life of Christian faith. So I'll read to you from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. The Apostle Paul writes, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you, that Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body which is broken for you. Eat it in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup that was on the table. And he said, this cup is a new covenant. that was sealed in my blood. Whenever you drink it, drink it in remembrance of me. For when we eat this bread and we drink this cup, we proclaim the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ until he comes again. So would you pray with me? Loving God, we thank you for the opportunity to share this meal today. Lord, we thank you for the invitation that no matter whether we feel good enough or or not, Lord, the invitation is equal to all of us to come to this table and share in community together. Lord, we thank you that this is a table that's bought by your grace. So, Lord, may this be a symbol of the rich sense of community that we feel and experience as followers of Jesus. That when we eat it and celebrate it in our homes rather than gather together, Lord, may we experience a beautiful sense of community centered around you and your spirit that's deeply present with each of us. So Lord, we're sorry for the times that 
we have let you down. We failed to love the way you've called us to love. But Lord, we thank you that your grace, your forgiveness is ever present in our life when we turn back to you once more. So we do that in this moment. And we pray the prayer that you taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. And forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial. And deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours. Now and forever we pray. Amen. So I invite you, those that are gathered here with us, uh, to celebrate in communion together, wherever you might be gathered from. Hopefully you've got the bread and the juice there on the table. So if I you take the bread, I'm going to sh- share with a couple of the guys that are on the team here. And then once you've had the bread and eaten that, then I invite you to take the cup and, and share that around as well as you're able to. So these are the gifts of God for the people of God. And for that, we are truly thankful. Use the body of Christ broken for you. And take the cup. Blood of Christ. Would you pray with me? Loving God, we thank you for the opportunity to share in this meal together. We pray that it would bind us together in faith and unity as a church gathered in many places but in one spirit. May it help us reconnect to you in faith, in trust and in confidence in who you are and all that you have done for us. We give you thanks, we give you praise, and may we as a church live out that witness of all that you have done for the world, of your gospel, wherever it is you call us to go. In your name we pray. Amen. song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Jesus, the name above every other name Jesus, the only one who could ever say, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. Well,
believe every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. another great service yeah this is the end of the formal part yeah but it doesn't have to be the end of your day yeah so go now into fellowship and community love one another share a meal play some board games and if you're not in a life group get amongst it yeah speak to the minister joshua shearer and um yeah so now church let this flow into your days and further into your week and thank you for a good service church